Thank you to Kathy from Levittown, a respiratory therapist at St. Joseph's Hospital in Bethpage. Thank you to Colleen from Belmore, an ICU nurse manager at NYU Winthrop Hospital. Thank you to David, a senior internal medicine resident on the front lines at Stony Brook Southampton Hospital. Thank you to Jessica, Alex, and Danielle, all from West Babylon. Jessica is a nurse practitioner at South Oaks Hospital. Alex and Danielle are RNs at Good Samaritan Hospital. And thank you to Rob, a cesspool serviceman and volunteer fireman and ambulance driver from Deer Park. Are you an essential worker or know someone who is? And we want to hear from you. All we need is the picture, the person's name, the village or town, and what that person does for a living. Every night, right here at 7, we will be thanking the people who have been on the front lines during this pandemic. Just go to the News 12 Facebook or Twitter page. Good evening, I'm Stone Grissom and welcome to our live coronavirus pandemic special report. Tonight, we have a doctor from Huntington Hospital to help you sort through what's going on with COVID-19 in our communities and across the region. And of course, this is a call in show, so we want to hear from you. Call in. Call us at the number right there at the bottom of your screen, 516-393-1800. Well, tomorrow, Tomorrow's the big day. Yeah, the island is on track to enter phase one of the state's reopening plan. That's set to begin just hours from now. Today, Governor Cuomo says Memorial Day didn't just mark the unofficial start of summer. It's the day we turn the page on COVID-19 and start focusing on rebuilding and restoring New York's devastated economy. Now, statewide to date, there are almost 364,000 New Yorkers who tested positive for the coronavirus. Look at those numbers. Almost 80,000 of those cases are right here on Long Island. Now, Suffolk Executive Ballone says tomorrow's opening is a reflection of how far the county has come. And in Nassau, and very optimistic, Laura Curran is already talking about phase two of reopening. The county executive still is warning a spike in new cases that will change the course of any reopening. Now the death toll, this is a tough numbers right here. These are across the state, still creeping up. Much slower, slower pace. Another 73 people died across the state on Monday. Now the governor says that is still the lowest level we've seen since it started. His words, he said in this absurd new reality, that is good news. That definitely is absurd reality, if that's good news. COVID-19 has claimed the lives of more than 23,500 people. That is statewide. Nassau and Suffolk residents were just you know, almost 4,000 of those deaths. Those are every number. That's a person. Think about that. All right, let's get to our discussion right now. Joining us tonight, Dr. Nick Fitterman of the Executive Director of Huntington Hospital. Thank you very much for your time. Um, let me start off by asking, uh, how, how are you holding up? How are your colleagues holding up right now? We're, we're holding up, Stone. Uh, great support from the community, and uh, the staff here are, are terribly committed. So um, I know that Huntington Hospital, at least in the beginning, uh, months ago, hit pretty hard. I mean, you guys were well over capacity. I know you've turned things around. Uh, how is it now at Huntington? How, how are you managing? We're definitely on the downslope. We uh, have capacity now. We've rolled back. The whole hospital at one point was a COVID unit, and we're down to only three COVID units now as we see the numbers in the state continue to creep down. Yeah, that's, that's I guess, in, as the governor says, in this absurd new reality, that's good news. Um, I, I know we were talking before the show, and, and as a point uh, you know, several doctors have made, and I know that you want to make this too, because uh, a lot of people still have a lot of trepidation, uh, trepidation about coming to the hospital, and that's causing its own problems, right? It is. We're seeing what they saw in Europe, uh, in Italy, and China reported on this, that um, patients are staying home with chest pain and dying of heart attacks at home. They're staying home with symptoms of stroke and coming to our hospital after the critical window with which we could give them life sparing and life saving treatments. Um, the message to stay out of the hospital in March and April was because we needed every bed and staff member to treat the COVID surge. It was never because we were afraid of giving you COVID. In fact, we have data now looking at what's called the zero positivity or the number of staff that work here that test positive for COVID and it's lower than what's in the community. Why? Because PPE, personal protective equipment, works. So you're actually safer here than if you're in the community. That's why China quarantined their staff for two months. They held on to them and didn't let them go home because they knew they were safer. 
when they finally got a hold of this. Not yeah. that we want to do that. We're not a communist country. Right, right. I know, but that's it's a great message too, and also for uh, you know civilians out here that uh, you know PPE works, masks work, gloves work. So uh, keep keep um, using them. Uh, let's go to the phones right now. Colleen from uh, Lindbrook. Colleen, you on the phone? Yeah. All right. What's your question tonight? Hi, Doc. Um, my question is, I'm a healthcare uh, frontline essential worker, and I know the facilities are all following CDC guidelines. Um, but this is one guideline I haven't been able to find um, when I Google stuff on CDC. Um, as a healthcare worker, you're allowed to go back to work, or must come back to work, I should say, uh, if you don't have a fever after 72 hours. So this could be in the window where you're still contagious, but you're not actually sick. So, so is the question... Do you feel that people can go to work as a health care provider and take care of non-COVID patients if they are positive COVID themselves? It's a great question. What you're referring to, you're right, was not a CDC recommendation. That was actually an executive order that came from the governor's office. And what it said was, we can bring health care workers back to the front lines if, with, without testing positive, if they've been exposed um, or if they had the disease. If you were exposed and you're without symptoms, you could come back to work. If you had the disease, you had to have be asymptomatic, meaning no fever for at least three days without taking any meds that would lower your temperature. And the symptoms ha it had to be at least seven days since symptom onset. The reason for this is, remember, at the peak of this, we, we were afraid we wouldn't have enough workers, and we came pretty close to it. We were bringing people in from out of state. Now, if you are doing everything you're supposed to do, wearing your mask, wearing gloves, wearing gown, washing hands, eye protection, and you are masking the patient, if you're following proper PPE and hand hygiene, you will not transmit the disease. Um, so do I think it's safe? Yes, with those restrictions. But that executive order was issued if need be. So now that we're on the other side of the curve, if you were in my hospital and you acquired the illness, I would not bring you back in seven days. We have plenty of staff right now. Okay, yeah, good advice for you calling. Uh, let's go to Noel from Valley Stream. You there? Yes, hi. How are you? What's your question tonight? Good, good evening. Uh, my question is this. In 1983, I was exposed to Guillain-Barre. Um, thank God I recovered, no uh, residue. And since then, I have not been able to have the, the flu vaccine or any types of vaccine. My question is this. When this, this vaccine comes out for COVID, my question is this. What happens to people like me or patients like me who cannot have vaccines? Where do we go? Who do I go to? Or how can, uh, what happens to me as a patient? Yeah, first, I'm, I'm thrilled that you recovered from your Guillain-Barre. Uh, and we don't have an answer yet to your question. What we know is we have seen, there are reports of Guillain-Barre occurring after COVID infection. So something happens after a vaccine that aggravates your immune system that causes Guillain-Barre. Similarly, after a viral infection, something happens that aggravates your immune system that can cause Guillain-Barre. What we don't know yet is if the risk of a vaccine for COVID-19 is worse than actually getting the disease. And, uh, and stay, stay tuned. We, we can't answer that for you yet, but, but we'll be able to help you with that risk-benefit decision in the future. Yeah, hmm, that's tough. Uh, let's go to Wanta. Linda, are you there? Yes, hi. Um, my question is, I have um, family and friends that have tested positive for the antibodies. Um, if you've tested positive for the antibodies, can you still infect or pass on the virus to other people? So the answer is, the short answer is no. They've had the disease, they've made antibodies, which means they've cleared the virus. So they are not infectious to you. In fact, those may be some of the safest people to uh, socialize with. Okay, um, let's go to Medford. Uh, Carol, you there? Hi, how are you? I'm doing great. My question is, since the virus is very contagious, why in some households all the family members would get it and in others only one family member would get it? It, it, it there's a couple reasons one could be how's the hygiene in that house is everyone washing hands uh, they're wiping surfaces down and and the other reason could be how symptomatic was the index case the first patient who got it in that household were they coughing all over the place not covering their mouth or um, were they uh, having symptoms so they were 
self-isolating. So there could be a number of reasons that would impact that. Yeah, that's how, that's always been curious to, to me too, because I, I hear stories all the time where some people get it and some people don't, and they're they're self-containing in the same same household. Um, how about Donna from Island Park? You there, Donna? Yes. Hi. Hi, Doctor. I have a question in regards to the virus living on surfaces, um, mail packages, etc. When the virus first started, they said it can. Then the CDC recently came out and says, no, it cannot live on surfaces. Don't make yourself crazy with your mail, your packages, or anything like that. But yet, you get different answers from different doctors. A doctor as early as last Friday said that it does live on surfaces. So I'm just trying to get the correct answer and what we're supposed to do to stay safe from. Yeah. So the answer is it does live on surfaces. And the CDC was walking back how long and how serious it could be. Um, on hard surfaces, we know it can last for hours. There was a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine stating on hard surfaces like metals, it can linger for nine hours on cardboard for several hours. It tends, it tends not to do well on porous surfaces like clothes, but it can live on hard surfaces. Now the degree of infectivity will, it will depend upon how many viruses are lying there. If there was a, a cough or a sneeze with a large droplet, there may be a lot of viruses there. Uh, and that's why it's so important to wash your hands before you touch a mucous membrane, before you touch your nose or your eyes or your mouth. If you've touched anything, if you've been out shopping or anywhere, you want to sanitize your hands before you move on. Yeah, that seems to be, that's going to be the new normal from now on. I've never washed my hands so many times and it's become kind of a habit. A good one, I guess. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a real quick break. We're going to have much more expert advice on how to keep you and your family safe from the coronavirus. And remember, this is a call-in show, so we want to hear from you. Call in. Call us now with your questions. That number does not change from night to night. 516-393-1800. We'll be right back. Welcome back to our live coronavirus pandemic special report. Let's bring back in Dr. Nick Fitterman, the executive director of Huntington Hospital. Thank you again for your uh, time. Um, Harvey has been waiting since the commercial break, so let's go to him right now. Harvey? Yeah, hi, good evening. So my question is, um, there is no doubt that the hospital admissions have decreased markedly. So the question is, um, you know, you, a month ago you drive and you see every night is Sunday night, nobody's on the road. Now things have changed. Uh, what do you think this, um, is going, this second wave is going to take place, and will it be as intense as the first? So um, I can't predict that with accuracy at this time. I can only warn what we've seen across the world and we should learn from it or we're doomed to repeat their history, what they've seen in Italy, in China, uh, in Singapore, even in France, where there have been bumps as they bump back up or second surges as they relax restrictions. Um, if we follow basic rules, keep our social distance, wear masks, hand sanitizers, uh, we can behave more like what we've seen in Japan and Taiwan, where they've been able to clamp down on this from the very beginning without a second surge at least to this point. Um, so it's really going to depend on, on what you do, on what the public does. And, and I'll tell you, as a healthcare worker, I thank you all. We could not treat our way out of this. We were not going to get through this without the help of the public. And you guys really stepped up and helped bend the curve. And uh, we need to continue that and not get complacent. Yeah, we're not through it yet. Um, let's go to uh, Northport. Allison, are you there? Hi, yes. Uh, my question is about testing, and I've heard so much about antibody and antigen testing, nose swab. I currently have no symptoms, but I'm wondering if I should get any of these tests as I don't want to infect anyone in the risk population. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great question and can cause some confusion. So if you don't have symptoms at this point, there's probably no reason to get tested with a few exceptions. One is that there's been an executive order from the governor stating those that work in nursing homes need to get tested for active disease. And that's what the nasal swab is. The nasal swab actually checks for RNA or one of the building blocks of the viruses. That reflects active disease almost always. The other test, the antibody test, 
is a test that shows you've already had the disease. So you're not infective if you have antibodies. If the nasal swab or what we call a PCR test is positive, you're contagious, you're infected. Then there's antigen tests, which also is a, can diagnose active disease. Think of it as kind of like a rapid strep test or a rapid pregnancy test that you may do. The problem is uh, all of these tests have different, different operating characteristics and they are, none of them are 100%. Uh, and they still need to be combined with the knowledge of exposure and symptoms or lack of, of symptoms. Okay. Um, how about uh, in Glencove, uh, Lou, are you there? Yes. What's your, um, what's your I, question? I have two grandchildren, four and seven. Am I safe? Are they safe? The two parents will be out working and I will be babysitting. I'm 68 years old with asthma. So uh, the answer would be how how much exposure have those kids had? Have they been uh, have they been able to accommodate the rules, obey the rules of social distancing? Uh, if they've been around a lot of other kids that can be a reservoir of disease, then there may be risk there because they may have minimal to no symptoms and transmit it to you. So um, if they have not been exposed to anyone with that you know with disease in the last seven, preferably 14 days, uh, you really don't have anything to worry about. Um, if, if, if they've been exposed to others in that time period, I'm, I might wait it out. Okay. Uh, let's try to get uh, uh, Helene from Mastic. Are you there? Yes, I am. What, what's your question? Uh, thank you for taking my question. I would like to know when you now, if you have to go for a mammography and after the mammography you get an ultrasound and your arms are freshly shaved, if you go in and the person before you was sweating on that machine and you go on the same machine and they use the same instrument from the ultrasound that the person before you had, with your arms freshly shaved, is there any chance that you can contact it through sweat or if they cut themselves and they were bleeding? Um, so right now we don't know if it's transmitted through blood, most likely not. Um, but more importantly, the patient was before you was in there breathing. They could have coughed, they could have sneezed, uh, creating an aerosol or leaving a droplet on the machine. But what, what we're doing is we're sanitizing everything between every patient. We are pretending that every patient has COVID, whether they do or don't. Um, for example, uh, if you came in here for a diagnostic test like that or for elective surgery, we've now created separate pathways not only whereby you would never cross paths with a, another COVID patient, but we have enhanced hygienic methods, including the ultraviolet C lights that you've heard about. And all hospitals are cleaning high touch areas. They would not put you back into that machine without wiping it down with the sanitizer first. Uh, and you shouldn't be inhibited about asking to make sure they did or even asking them that you can watch them do it. it it's your health. All right. But well, uh, this is unfortunately that's all the time we have. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fitterman, uh, for uh, coming out of the show tonight and, and sharing your expertise. And thank you for watching. Thank you for your calls. And we'll see you tomorrow night right at seven.